allow Ukraine to be carved up is the independence of any nation secure? I'd respectfully suggest the answer is no. We have to stand up to this naked aggression. Sovereignty, territorial integrity, human rights, these are the core tenets of the UN Charter, the pillars for peaceful relations among nations, without which we cannot achieve any of our goals. That has not changed, and that must not change. Yet, for the second year in a row, this gathering dedicated to peaceful resolution of conflicts is darkened by the shadow of war. An illegal war of conquest brought without provocation by Russia against its neighbor, Ukraine. Like every nation in the world, the United States wants this war to end. No nation wants this war to end more than Ukraine. And we strongly support Ukraine in its efforts to bring about a diplomatic resolution that delivers just and lasting peace. But Russia alone, Russia alone bears responsibility for this war. Russia alone has the power to end this war immediately. And it's Russia alone that stands in the way of peace, because the Russia's price for peace is Ukraine's capitulation, Ukraine's territory, and Ukraine's children. Russia believes that the world will grow weary and allow it to brutalize Ukraine without consequence. But I ask you this. If we abandon the core principles of the United States to appease an aggressor, can any member state in this body feel confident that they are protected? If we allow Ukraine to be carved up, is the independence of any nation secure? I'd respectfully suggest the answer is no. We have to stand up to this naked aggression today and deter other would-be aggressors tomorrow. That's why the United States, together with our allies and partners around the world, will continue to stand with the brave people of Ukraine as they defend their sovereignty and territorial integrity and their freedom. President Biden addressing the United Nations General Assembly. And you may have seen the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, in the hall listening so poignant President Biden said we are at an inflection point in world history, and he said what is at stake? Sovereignty, territorial integrity, human rights. Of course, what he was talking about most there was Ukraine, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and he made the case that it cannot be allowed to stand. It was about a, a 27, 28-minute address. He waited until 20 minutes in to bring up Russia for the very first time, but once he did, it was clear where the direction of this address was going and the point that he wanted to make to bolster world su support for Ukraine's effort, to try to sustain the world support for that effort. Here outside the United Nations, walking along, uh, watching alongside beside me, CNN Chief National Security Analyst Jim Shudo and our senior White House correspondent, Kayla Tausche. Jim, what did you hear there? Listen. That was his key message. There's a reason he ended on that point about Ukraine and the message to the world. And I think you could read it as an appeal for the sake of Ukraine, but also a challenge to the members of this body, perhaps even some prodding. He, he said it's essential to the UN Charter, three principles, sovereignty, territorial integrity, and human rights, all of which are being violated right now in Ukraine by, by a, an invasion of, of choice by Russia. And he notes, for the second year in a row, he said they were darkened by the shadow of war in Ukraine in effect saying, and he goes on to say, we'll be judged by whether we stand up to this. You know, the UN was founded in the wake of, in, in the destruction post-World War II to prevent another devastating war, right? And here we are, 70, 80 years later, with the largest war in Europe since World War II. And it persists for a second year. And his message is, in effect, we cannot, as members of this body, committed to what we're committed to, let it go on. And by the way, if we, members of this body, don't stand up to this, none of us are safe. And it will come to your doorstep. Yes, exactly. And of course, he is addressing the issue of Russia, a permanent member uh -huh. of the United Nations Security Council. So obviously a very sensitive matter, mm -hmm. Kayla. And he said Russia alone, alone, 
bears responsibility for this. That Langdon was one of the Parker. lines that stood out to me, where he laid the blame for the invasion squarely at the feet of Russia, whose foreign minister is expected to be in attendance at the General Assembly this week. But notable, considering that up until this point, all of the draft resolutions at the Security Council uh, to end the war in Ukraine for you know various allies around the world to condemn the war in Ukraine have failed because of Russia's membership on the UN Security mm. Council. And so it's an important distinction that that the president was making there. And also to our earlier conversation about the shades of domestic politics that are, if not overtly present in today's speech, at least were um, seen as allusions by the president to domestic politics. One in particular where he said, history need not dictate our future. He then went on to talk about the U.S. rejoining UNESCO, which is the educational and cultural body that President Trump withdrew from in 2017 and President Biden rejoined just this summer. He then went on to talk about the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the World Trade Organization, the G20, all multilateral organizations that if the former president did not threaten to withdraw from, he maligned in some way. So President Biden trying to reestablish the U.S. position of leadership on the world stage and, you know, sort of obliquely referencing those domestic politics. But you're right. The fact that he ended on Russia and Ukraine with about 10 minutes of his speech shows that that's where he really wanted the viewer and the audience mm. to come away with a lasting impression. And I kept on looking at the audience, looking at the face of the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky to see if I could gauge yeah. any reaction. How did he feel about what President Biden was saying? It was impossible to read anything from his yeah. face, Jim. But were, was there enough for Zelensky in that? Well, see, I mean, that, that line uh, that he had about protecting Ukraine was the one applause line, right? Yes. And, and, and this body... It's failed in a number of ways, uh, preventing and stopping this war. But the vast majority of members have voted to condemn the war. Right? There is some relative unity in that in that room there against Russia's invasion, but it, that has not managed the essential task, right, of ending that war. And you, you watched uh, Zelensky there. He, of course, applauded at the end. But but I think we can be fairly certain that his private meetings with U.S. officials continue to be quite pressing. We need more help. Where are those F-16s, right? Yes, we're doing our best in this counteroffensive, but why did you hold us back? Why did you tie our hands on these weapon systems? That's their view of it. So I am certain in private rooms around here, he's pushing for more and saying this is a crucial time. Kayla, not here today, and we haven't had a chance to address this yet, there are several world leaders who are almost always here who were not. The Prime Minister of the United Kingdom is not here. President of France is not here. Prime Minister of India is not here. And then two leaders who haven't been here for a few years, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping. How do you think that hangs over what we're watching? Well, I think that the White House would say that President Biden has very robust open lines of communication with the U.K. and France. They speak often. They speak frequently. And to be sure, many of those world leaders were just in India together for the G20. And then, of course, there was the BRICS summit of emerging market nations in South Africa that took place earlier in August. Later this fall, you have APEC, which is an Indo-Pacific-focused economic summit that's going to be taking place in San Francisco. And that's really where administration officials are expecting. President Biden and President Xi of China to possibly meet on the sidelines of that visit in a bilateral format. And then you have COP28, which is the climate focus summit, which is taking place in Dubai. So there are all of these various fora for leaders to be meeting. When you talk to foreign policy experts, they say that some leaders go forum shopping. If they yeah. feel like they can't get from the UN, for instance, or the G20, what they're trying to get, then they'll go somewhere else. And by the way, some of those fora are directly competitive to, to this institution and also to the US view of the world. BRICS is expanding uh, because you have a meeting in the minds, you know, quite a disparate group of nations there, but a meeting of the minds to say we 